I've been welcoming Oliver Brock from the university, uh, or the Technical University in Berlin, uh, with his talk, What is There to be Skeptical About? Wow, I get an applause before I even started. Thanks. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to live up to that. Um, when you go to a physics conference, uh, people actually debate. And uh, I think this is something that our community maybe has not, uh, has, has forgotten how to do, right? People ask very benign questions. I overheard a conversation after the first session asking Nick, oh, wow, that was a really bold question, really putting somebody, to, you know, it was a totally, I think, a reasonable question. So we, we are scared of confrontation. I am not. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try to play this really nice, okay? Um, because I do love deep learning, really. And, and after the session today, I know that deep learning solves all problems. <laughs> really, because, because all the papers I've seen, they solve a problem, right? So, so we really infer it must solve all problems, right? That's a totally reasonable thing to do. Nobody's talking about failures. Nobody's talking about, you know, I tried this and it didn't work. So, of course, we all have the impression it solves all problems. Good. So we're done. I'm done. See you next year. You know, Dieter, Dieter already painted a picture. It's, it's a gloomy picture, right, of us becoming network manipulation monkeys. Um, yeah, so, so let's, let's talk about that. Obviously, I said, I, I love deep learning. So there's lots of successes. We've seen many of them this morning. Um, you know, computer vision, of course, but, but uh, also in other disciplines. And they're blowout successes. I mean, they really, they have, they have shattered our conceptual understanding of, of what it is that we're doing. We should not take this lightly. We need to really pay attention to this. But we, okay, so the but comes later. Um, so, so, so there's the promise of this end-to-end. Right? I would claim nothing I've seen so far is actually end to end. And, and this morning in the first presentation, we heard that making the network structure the right structure is actually really key. So end to end to me would be, would be you could put any network there and it just learns whatever you want to do. It, it doesn't work like that, right? So, so you know, this pixel to torque thing, um, I, I, I've never seen it, right? There's always a lot of knowledge engineering put into the network and into the training procedure. So, so we need to be aware of it. Um, so the promise of, of achieving all of this is by using a general function, neural network, and by using a gradient, and by using lots of data. So, so this is fantastic. Why then this workshop where, where the word skeptic, are the skeptics right? Who, who is a skeptic, right? I mean, I'm not skeptical of deep learning. I mean, I'm not skeptical of linear algebra. That doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense, right? What I'm skeptical of is us. Because when I see research videos, right, that, that seem like, uh, you know, people coming from a sports event, you know, cheering out the window, and, you know, it, it clearly is a sign of something fantastic going on. But it's also a sign that we need to ask ourselves, are we letting emotion take over? Are we really still sort of rational scientists? Or are we just so infatuated with this surprising event that, that we're, we're losing track of, of what our mission really is, which is, in my view, to really gain an understanding of what robotics or intelligence is about. So, as was said, right, I mean, we're, we're, we're showing these networks, and we've seen many of these architectures. We just swallow that, right? I'm showing you a network, and then I'm showing you a video, and you say, okay, great, that problem is solved. Uh, you know, there's probably lots of grad students here. Don't, don't think like that, please. Right? We, we, we need you, as, as real scientists, to, to solve some hard problems. This is part of it, as Dieter said. Right? This is going to remain part of our community, just as kinematics, just as linear algebra, and so on and so forth. So, so we are in the labs finicking with these network structures. And, and I cannot help. It reminds me of this guy. This is, this is an alchemist. And he took 5,500 liters of urine and invented phosphorus, or discovered phosphorus, OK? So he did that by what, what Dieter was saying, we're, we're doing in the lab, we're, we're modifying little networks and so on. He did it, you know. The, out of, the outcome of it was chemistry. We're all sitting here because of chemistry, right? Our clothes and computers. Chemistry is super important. And we started with, with playing around. So, so I'm not saying let's not play around, but we got to make sure that we keep in mind that our goal is to build the chemistry. We need to build the, the periodic table of, of robotics. 
And we won't do that by just showing you, you know, networks and saying, here's 15 videos and it worked. Okay. So I'm going to try, and, and try is here with very capital letters, font, large and, and bold, to, to sort of take a turn and, and try to think about this problem for a little bit. So, so to me, robotics is about intelligence, right? Uh, and, and so what is intelligence? We, we always see these black boxes. Let's take a black box. Let's take the human. It's, it's the strongest evidence of intelligence that, that we've seen. The input to our black box is about 300 million nerves that sample the environment at 100, 200 hertz. The output, you could argue about it, is 600 to 800 muscles, or if you want to go to motor unit level, about 100, 200,000 motor units. So it's a huge problem, right? So, so you, if you assume that nature, to some degree, is parsimonious, then maybe you will actually need this kind of input and this kind of output to make this work. So as computer scientists, right? I, I'm a computer scientist by training. I think of exponential functions, right, with 300 million in the exponent. And that uh, gets uh, complicated. So, <clears throat> so we need to think about this. And, and we have, in our pre-deep learning ta past, developed some very powerful things that help us address this or, or deal with it. One of them is the no-free-lunch theorem. Or as, as a matter of fact, there are actually several no-free-lunch theorems. If you guys are grad students and have not heard of them, please look them up. I think they're, they're very, very important. They basically say that any two algorithms are equivalent in their performance if you average over all possible problems. All right? So it means that if you want to solve all problems, all algorithms have equal performance. And if you want to solve problems that have 300 million input dimensions, all algorithms are going to be really, really horrible. How horrible is horrible, right? I, I want to scare you. I want to scare you. Uh, by this, you know, the horribleness of this problem. Let me try to do that. There's a physicist, his name is Bremermann, and he, uh, you know, using results of Einstein about mass and energy equivalency and using uh, results about Schroeder about uncertainty relationship, he basically derived a physically maximum limit of computation performed by matter. It turns out to be 1.36 times 10 to the 50 bits per second per kilogram. Okay, so that's a large number. Let's take a computer the size of the Earth, and that will be able to do 10 to the 75 ops per second. Ah, you know, we're, this is deep learning, right? It's, it's, the, it's the gold digging age. Let's not skimp around with a small planet like ours. Let's take the universe, OK? I'm, I'm talking about the entire matter in the universe, which is about let me know, 10 to the 52 kilograms, <coughs> operating at the physical limit of computation. OK, so, so this is what we can get out of our universe. This is the computer I'm offering you. Now here's the problem. Um, so yeah, so, so the problem is you know, 10 to the 103 operations per second. That's pretty good. Here's the problem, right? We have a 600 pixel eye with binary, with binary nerve receptors. So you get 2 to the 600 different images, right? Makes sense. So that's about uh, 10 to the 200, which is much, much bigger than 10 to the 103, which would be the operations per second, right? So the combinatorics of the problem that we're dealing with, even for very small things, with, a, with an exponent of 200, are beyond grasp. And of course, the, the 600 pixels that we have here are, are way smaller than the 300 million input dimensions. So if the universe, since the Big Bang, could not enumerate a 600-dimensional example, what, what are we thinking? Right? I mean, why, why do we actually think we can solve a 300 million dimensional input problem with a general algorithm, right? So, so I think we can't. All right, so, so, so the no-free lunch theorem is a theorem, and now I gave you an example. Um, so so th these two things together I take as evidence for my assumption, right? I'm basically saying, the problems that we want to solve, they don't live in some abstract space, they actually exhibit structure. And it's because of this structure that you guys are sitting here and you're able to listen to me. You're exploiting this structure to parse acoustic signals, to understand the concepts that I'm talking about. And, and to me, this is the only hope we have. We need to understand this structure, and then we can solve these 300 million dimensional problems. So this is my assumption. 
You can disagree, because there is debate on the no-free lunch theorem and whether it applies to you know, the general world or just to you know, the strictly mathematical universe that they use to, to derive the theorem. So, so this assumption can be debated. To me, it makes a lot of sense. It matches all of my experience in the 400 years of being a roboticist. So, so I'm, I'm assuming that this is true. So now, now we can make several conclusions or hypotheses. Right? Either the problem we want to solve is actually really simple and the no free lunch theorem doesn't apply, then let's just go on using deep learning. We don't need anything else because the problem is simple. Second hypothesis is neural networks capture exactly the right prior and therefore they're so successful. Right? This is, this is a, a reasonable thing to assume. The third thing is both of these two things hold together. And the third thing is, the fourth thing, which I believe, we must incorporate task-specific priors into learning. Right? So I'm giving you a clue what I think. Okay? <laughs> the fourth hypothesis is the right one, I think. Right? So, so, but obviously, we need to actually look at what is the prior encoded in networks. And if you, if you see a little bit of a prior, for example, like in convolutional networks, really changes the game. Right? In, in computer vision, where you have two-dimensional images, it really made a big difference. OK, so I think Dieter said the same thing. But deep learning is one component, right? It's one component that seems to be very successful for a certain type of problem. We need to understand what is that type of problem, and we need to understand what are all the other tools in our tool shed, right? We, we shouldn't go around just with our deep learning hammer. We should actually use all the other tools. So, so what's the deal here? Um, yeah, so I'm the deep learning hammer, but what's the deal, right? The deal is that we have a spectrum of problems, and, and on the one side, we know very little about the prior, and we have easy ways of getting at data, or maybe complicated ways of getting at data. On the other side, we, we, we know a lot about the problem, or we have trouble getting at data, right? So, so this is one particular spectrum of problems. We can make up many, many others, but let's look at these, right? So on the left side, I would say, I'm using this word in reference to Nick, <laughs> Hyperparameterized to friendshipable function, right? So, in other, in other word, neural networks, although neural networks, I think, are much more sp specific than, than this concept, right? So, so we, that, that makes sense. If we don't know anything, let's try something that's very generic. If we know something, we've invented a lot of algorithms that work a lot. If we want to sort, use quicksort or bubble sort or something, of course, neural networks can sort things, of course, but why would you want to use that? Why wouldn't you want to use a deep neural network to learn kinematics? We've solved that problem, right? It's not impressive that you can solve it. It's a solved problem. Try to solve unsolvable problems. That would be good. Or, you know, we have something in the middle where, where there's sort of specialized algorithms that incorporate some notion of prior, right? But, but a sort of, um, um, yeah, more specialized. So. Really, the mission I think we should be following is not deep learning for everything. I think the mission we should be following is let's understand what are the tools we have and what problems are they good for. And then let's understand how we can solve components of problems with the tools that are the best tools for that sub-problem. So we need to start to understand how we can bring our repertoire of solutions together, including deep learning, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I mean, I'm not saying don't try. If you think, <clears throat> well, why, why are you trying to solve kinematics with a deep network? It's because you think that your next step of solving a next harder problem also needs to be a deep network, so somehow you need to be compatible. I'm saying, well, wouldn't it be fantastic if we have forward kinematics implemented, you know, with uh, homogeneous transforms and the way, and we can plug a neural network on top, right? So, 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 so then the need for doing this would go away. So, so I'm saying we're, we are already you know, stuck 
in the let's do everything with deep learning route if, we, if we're doing what you're proposing. We should say, well, you know, really the problem we need to solve is how do we stick everything together, right? This is on the one side we have a neural network, on the other side we have an algorithm. Well, you know, we want to actually combine these two, right? Because now all of a sudden we have combinatorial explosion of possibilities. Right, really cool. So, so that's what uh, my student Rico, who's sitting right there, uh, is, is trying to do. So, so the idea is, as I said, how do we get priors into our learning methods? Well, neural networks have a certain prior. Our algorithms have a certain prior. We need to combine that. And every prior needs to be solved to solve the, used to, to solve the right subproblem. So I, I, I actually, uh, I held, how much time? Dieter went over, so I can go over too, right? Okay. Yeah? A quick question to elaborate on that. So you talk about the structure of a neural network being a prior. And clearly there is structure there that's very important. But in terms of, it seems strange to call it a prior because a lot of times that structure is not equally applicable. So it's not clear how the design of the network is actually going to affect that. Do you think that there's anything we can do to try to improve that? Or is it going to be a fundamental problem? Well, okay, so, he, so, so I think it's an excellent point, and I think that uh, everybody who's working on deep learning should be thinking about this, because we need to get to the point where we don't get up here and show a network architecture and say, look, it works, but we say, this is what I've learned from this that you, network architect number 214, can apply from this, right? So we need to get to that. For me, for me uh, I guess, and that makes me a skeptic, even though I do love deep learning, um, the skeptic in me would say, it's great as a tool until we understand what's really going on, right? Ultimately, a neural network learns a function. Once I know what that function is, and it might be hard to extract it, but once I know, why would I not that just, just implement that, right? So, so maybe the network is the, is the most compact way of representing that function, and then I would be very surprised. But, but if that's the case, then we have found the right representation for a type of problem, and that's fantastic. So, so, you know, I mean, you're putting your finger in, you know, in the sore spot, but, but we as a community, I think, have to, have to address your question. Cool. I think one thing we should avoid is claiming that uh, deep learning people don't do these kind of things or they shouldn't do these kind of things, right? If you look at it, yeah, I mean, people know about these issues, right? And there are work on, like, learning disentanglement and stuff like that, where you have very specific network structures that are actually well suited to learn certain dimensions of lighting conditions and images and all this kind of stuff. So it's not quite at the level where all the deep learning people are just drawing huge networks and stuff and say, oops, I get a number, right? I'm overgeneralizing uh, for the point, for, for the, you know, for the, for the, for, to make a point. Uh, you know, any statement that puts everybody into one bag doesn't make sense. I do have to say, however, that I'm yet to read a deep learning paper where I find the experimental evaluation compelling, right? So, so I, I see some people going like this, right? So, so I have to say that they're, they're all straw man evaluations, and this is not helping. It's not helping because we're not learning what is actually the power of the tool, what are the limits of the tool. We're, we're, we're engaging in, in something that's even pre-alchemy, Right? It's, it's, it's fashion, or I don't know. Uh, I, I, so, so this is obviously, you know, uh, I, I know that uh, I'm criticizing some people in the room, and, and I think I should be able to do that, and we should be able to look at their papers, go through them, and, you know, I, I'm glad, I'd be glad to tell you what I think the right experimental evaluation would have been. And I'm sure that many people will come to me with papers and say, well, that's really impressive. Now I love deep learning even more. But, but I think this is a workshop, and, uh, you know, I... Given that nobody was skeptical, I wanted to, you know, be a little bit provocative. I had a follow-up comment about the kinematics thing. I think we need to make a distinction between exact problems and approximations. Since we've already kind of established these are, uh, make sense, hyperparameters are function approximators. If those kind of trap these are good, if the exact computation I think has been proved <coughs> for the same, these probably are not the right answer. So, so right. I mean, the, the, I think you know every tool has its right zone of applicability, and we need to understand what that is. So, I, I agree with that. 
OK, so let me try to continue. Um, so, so lots of things that we're doing in the lab are actually uh, trying to get structure into the lab, I just, uh, into, into learning algorithms. I just want to show you some examples. So, so here, um, in the middle, you see the perception um, that the robot on the left, there's a small robot here in a, in a rectangular room. This is the input. And we're basically trying to learn a mapping from this to a representation that helps the robot to, to navigate this environment. Um, the idea is that, we, as a prior, we incorporate Newton's law. There's a publication, if you're interested in this. So, so Newton is a very you know, famous guy, and his laws apply pretty much everywhere that our robots would go. So we think that's a pretty good prior to use, and it, it actually helps. Another thing, this is also Rico's work. Uh, another thing is, is learning with side information. Actually, uh, so there's also publication, but before explaining the details, I just want to give you one quick example. The idea is you, uh, th th sorry, this is Rico and, uh, and Sebastian who are doing this work. So you want to learn this function, mapping from 3 to 14 and so on, and if you guys want to take 30 seconds to guess what the function is, some of you will find out. You have lots of smart people in the room. Um, but it's very easy to find out if you know that the immediate result uh, is you know, 9, 25, and 4. And so it's easy to say that the function is x squared plus 5. So this additional information helped you very, very greatly figure out what that function is. So, so this other paper is a way of formalizing lots of work that's in the area of machine learning using this side information into a coherent framework so that you can, when you have a problem where you have side information, can basically, I don't know, generate possible um, ways of using that side information. Yeah? Excuse me? Very, very good point. So very good point. And actually, I wanted to say to, to, to the intuitive physics, people actually have very poor intuitive physics. So they did studies with college students, no offense to anybody in the room, where, where they rolled balls, th balls through certain structures and asked the students to continue the trajectory once the ball leaves the structure. And you know, it was simple things like rolling the ball off a table. Does it fall straight down? Does it continue straight? Or does it fall on a parabola? We are, as roboticists, not a good representational group. People are really, really poor at this. You know, there's, there's, there's people that have studied this. So we have some very basic intuition about physics, but actually our physics, our real understanding of physics is actually pretty poor. And we still manage to do all these things, which, you know, I don't know what that means. Sorry, I think that... Yeah, so, so this was a learning problem for a robot moving in the world. Um, and so, basically, things moving in the world obey Newton's laws. And so, it seemed like a good match. Yeah? So, are prior directly putting in, or are you saying prior yeah. to be able to see what's happening? Right. Yeah, so we can call knowledge prior's uh, constraints. It's, you know, I think we know. Okay. That, that, that I think we would need to discuss afterwards. I'm a proud alchemist. <laughs> I'm a proud, don't get me wrong, I'm a proud alchemist. We all are, okay? We, we don't want, want to believe it, but, but uh, we, we're all alchemists. We don't have a periodic table of robotics yet, I think. So yes, that's alchemy. And alchemy is fantastic because we're working towards this periodic table. All I'm saying is, let's not forget what our goal is. Our goal is not to come up with cool tricks. Our goal is to come up with what is robotics, actually. Well, what you learn, what you learn is actually a framework of doing, um, state of doing a representation learning that incorporates priors, right? So, so it's an instance, right? And, and it's a certain specific problem, it's a specific prior, but, but you get to, you know, the, it's put into a framework that allows you to put random problems, random priors, and see what happens in representation learning, right? So I've, I, I can only show it to you for a finite number of problems, but you're welcome to take the same thing and apply it to your problem. 
Okay. Now I'm a little bit behind. I, I still want to show you, and I'm going to do this very briefly, so you're going to have to talk to Rico if you want the details, um, about this merging of, I'm going to show you one more time, right? Merging neural networks and algorithmics uh, or algorithms. So the idea, the toy problem, <clears throat> this is, I think the results are two days old. So this is, you know, the very first, um, very first study on a very simple, well-known problem. It's localization in a one-dimensional world. Um, there's a robot moving around. There's a hallway with three doors. The robot can detect whether there's a wall or a door next to it, and the task is to localize. So there's lots of people here that have written books. As a matter of fact, this picture is from a book that lots of people here have written. Um, so yeah, we basically would like to use a histogram filter to do that. A histogram filter is an algorithmic structure that you guys probably are familiar with that is well suited to do this. It's an instance of a base filter. Um, and, and yeah, the idea is that this structure uh, helps you localize. I'm going to jump through all the explanation of the algorithm to the end. And I'm going to just basically point you to the key points, right? So the idea is that this is actually showing you a recurrent neural network. But it is in the structure of a histogram filter. So these, um, these dashed lines are fixed. They're, they're basically hard-coded structure of the network, right? This is, I mean, this is similar to, this, to the pictures I've been criticizing, right? But there's two parts here that are being learned. One is this part here, which corresponds to the uh, motion model, and this part here, which is the, ob um, the observation model. So this maps an observation to a distribution over states, um, and, and this basically is the motion model which maps one state into the next. This is really cool, but I think I should stay on time, so therefore I will not be able to explain the details. Like I said, Rico can give you all the details. The idea is that this is a neural network. Actually, it's not a neural network. It's a differentiable function, right? Because there's lots of things in there that are not neural network. It's a differentiable function in the, that matches the structure of the histogram filter algorithm. Differentiable is cool because now we can actually use backprop to learn the parameters of this, and the two things that we have to learn is the motion model and the observation model. So we can train a recurrent neural network with data to extract from that data the, the motion and the observation model, the sensor model. <clears throat> so uh, like I said, uh, the details I have to skip, but let me show you some of the results. Um, this is the Sensing the, the sensor measurement model that we that we learn, and not surprising, red is uh, one, blue is zero. You see that at the doors, there's a significant detection, right, of of being at the door. Um, these are the this is the motion model st starting from the state here. If you don't do anything, you stay there. If you go left, you go left. If you go right, you go right. So this is not so surprising. But let's look at some of the actual rollouts of um, of the of the training data. So what you see here on top is uh, the environment, and there's 11 states shown here. And again, the color indicates the probability of being in one of those states. And you see here the time rolling out where the robot takes an action at every time. The, the actions are Brownian motion. And the robot is Brownian moving itself through this environment, and it's sensing, and it's supposed to derive its sensor model and its motion model to localize. And you see here the traces. You see that very quickly there's two main hypotheses that are being tracked. Um, and uh, at stage 16, the robot basically has localized itself. These are different traits. traces. It's, it's kind of interesting um, that really there's sort of two distinct hypotheses in several of these examples that are being tracked down. You could really visualize this as a histogram filter, right? You can visualize every slice here actually as a histogram. Well, it is, it is a histogram. But the motion model and the sensor model are learned. If you compare this with the ground truth, then you see that um, the ground truth is now indicated by the black lines. You see that actually it tracks very well. This, this is, like I said, for Brownian motion um, in, in, the, um, in this hallway. So we're not solving the problem of actually picking the action. The action is picked for the robot. Of course, we need to have our straw man ground truth comparison. 
So we're comparing this to recursive neural networks or to two-layered recursive neural networks or to a long short-term memory also with two layers. Um, and you see, you see the outcome. You see that um, basically they are not able to really learn this. And in quantitative terms, this is again the number of training steps. This is the number of, of, of steps that the robot is taking through the hallway. You have to note that this is Brownian motion. So even with a, with a sequence of 100 steps, it probably has not seen all, all states yet, right? So that's why we need rather long training sequences. And then you get the test accuracy after 32 steps of, of testing, right? So the robot tests for 32 steps using the learned model. And the question is, has it localized by then? And you see that with 200 steps, it localizes in about 90% of the cases, which is much better than the two other, um, or the four other network models. Okay. So the idea here was to try to bridge both worlds. We've come up with a lot of algorithms, and we've seen the power of, of hyperparametric functions. So wouldn't it be cool if you can put the two together? This is what, we've, what we're trying to do. This is a very first toy example to show that this might be possible, and that actually it works rather well, that the structure that we put into the hyperparametric function by making it look like a histogram filter helps a lot to learn with respect to unconstrained recursive neural networks or the long short term memory uh, neural networks. Okay, so to come to a conclusion, I think that the no free lunch theorem implies that we need a tool chest. We don't just need one tool. And we need to understand which tool is good for which job. Deep learning right now is a super cool tool. It is super cool, it is super powerful, and it will change the face of robotics. No, it has changed, no question about it. But we need to be aware that it will not solve all problems. This is, in my view, a consequence of the no free lunch theorem, if you accept that it holds. And if you do, then you know half of you go off and do deep learning, but the other half try to do things that connect deep learning to the rest of the things that we've developed over the last 50 years. I think that is something that would be really good for our community. Okay, thank you. Great, um, I think Peter, if you want to set up your computer and we can have one or two questions. And please use the microphones uh, here in the, in the middle. There's a question in the back. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, just wanted to make a comment. The, the reason we don't have free lunch is because we're using average to evaluate our performance. So if you have a human system and we evaluate writing, that would be equivalent of evaluating writing with our hands, with our mouth, with our ears. <laughs> and on average, we don't do that. What we ought to be looking to build your periodic table and to find the matching between the tasks and the systems that we have, we need to look for the max function, right? What is the system that gives me best performance for my given task? And you put the structure there. And that's basically what we're doing with the empirics, empirical approach. So, so the, the no free lunch theorem actually is about exactly this. It's about optimization. So right. it's about having a huge space that you can optimize over. Right. So to, to find the system that is best. And this is exactly what the no flange theme applies to. But if you're looking on the entire space and kind of trying to, to apply for every system that you have in a human being, right? This is exactly what we need to avoid. I completely right. agree with you. And, and, and we should not, uh, you know, uh, basically I'm, I'm, I'm alluding or I'm implying that just trying to do deep learning for everything is a little bit like doing that, right. like, like right. not having information about the problem and having to solve the entire space. Right. Just come in. Yeah, thank you. Another question? So Oliver, I, I love the hypotheses that you laid out. And you, your, your contention is the fourth hypothesis, hypothesis that you need task priors. But it might also be that the problems are easier than we think. And I think that would be some of 
Dieter's uh, thesis as well, which is that, you know what, modeling, you know, the hand tracking is actually just an easy function approximation problem, and we, we should be thinking about more problems like that. Thoughts? Yeah, no, I totally agree. I think the problems are much easier than we think. The hard part is the path towards that easy solution. Uh, and, and it's clear that um, deep neural networks are a good way to find easy solutions that we don't understand very well. Uh, so it's unclear how much they will help us solve other problems. But, but yeah, I, I totally agree that problems are actually much easier. Otherwise, we would not exist, right? I mean, nature doesn't invent complicated things. It tries to find simple solutions. So, so yeah, I, I, think, I think both of these are true. And all of them could be true, right? All right, thank you very much, Oliver. Um, our next speaker is Peter Beal from UC 